No power, no movement. Green to oil. Touch oil. It's good to see you all. Wonderful. And um, you are the future. I am the past. So let the past talk to the future a little bit. First of all, let us just make it so clear what kind of position you are in. You are young, you are in one of the most prestigious universities of Korea slash Asia, and you have the drive to do something with your life, with your country's life, maybe concerning this whole earth. Now what can you do with your energy, your youth, your perspective, your desires, your aspirations? That's what we came here to talk about. But if we do not know clearly, if we do not understand what kind of situation we are in, then your view on reality will be just as removed as another planet. So first, let's become clear what kind of situation we are here on this Earth. And number one, it's not just because it's Zen or Korean Sun, but let's draw a circle. A circle. This circle means that something is inside and outside. If this is your personality, then whatever you have inside is yourself. And whatever you have outside is the world. Slash the other. Everybody grows up like this. If you don't grow this kind of membrane like cells have, then the cells cannot exist. Also, you without a notion of self or your own ego cannot exist. You grow this as a natural consequence of being born your mind into your body. Comes with the job. That job is being born. Then growing up, doing something meaningful. Then we all get old and we all die one day. When does that happen? We don't know. But what we know is that compared to the age of this earth, our life is very, very short. Our life as a human being is about this little dot of 70, 80 years and the continuity of life existing on this planet which is estimated 2 billion years plus is this huge continuity in linear time. <coughs> situation on this earth versus our situation is very different time-wise. We are living in three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. That means you can make a U-turn in space. You just go out of the campus and something says, man possible, make a legal U-turn. That's your GPS. But in time, you cannot make a U-turn. One dimensional, brutal, impermanent, irreversible time. Now, if you realize that soon enough, you will realize how precious our time is. So here, U-turn, is okay. Here U-turn doesn't exist. You can't reverse it. And while you're young and you are so happy to kind of have the energy to do things and meet people and pursue desires, you don't realize this. And by the time you really know what's going on, half of your life is over. Now save yourself the trouble and have some kind of early realization what it means to be impermanent. So when you know how precious time is, then you have some traction over life. That's the first sign you're becoming serious, that you're not wasting it. It doesn't mean you cannot relax, but it means that every single moment counts. Now, let's be a little bit Buddhist here just for the sake of a transcendental view. We believe that we have this notion from past, present into the future. But in fact, our experience confirms that the only thing we can validate 
is this moment and this moment only. So if you truly want to understand the nature of time, then perceive it as this moment only where past, present and future all converge. So this moment is when past, present and future all come together. That means the past is gone and the future hasn't come and the present is a projection only. I need you to stop this now and pay attention, please. Thank you. Very good. And if you have this moment completely in your awareness, if you can totally pay attention to this moment, then you have control over past, present and future. If you lose this moment, you lose everything. And that's why your mind practice, whatever you do, whatever you use to be here and now, is so important. That's the only thing we really have. And the intersection of time and space, here and now, is the moment that we have. Now with this kind of mind, you can see cause and effect. Because whatever is relevant from the past to the present, you can see here as a result. Result of past actions, speech, thoughts, feelings, whether it's your own individual thing, your families, your nations, your civilizations, it's all here. It's the result. And what you have here in the present will be the cause of the future. And that is karma as we know it, cause and effect as we know it. Okay? Your actions can become habits, your thoughts and feelings and speech can become habits. These habits can become personality traits. The personality traits can become personalities. Personalities can become the notion of self or ego. And these egos as individuals, they start to interact and form families, groups, societies, civilizations. Anything you change in yourself, you have already changed in the world. And anything you don't change in yourself and leave undone remains the same until you change it. That's the law of causality. So first we talked about impermanence. Then now we talked about interdependence, how we depend on each other with our cause and effect relationships. And now we talk about imperfection, the third mark of our existence. So the first is impermanence. then interdependence and then imperfection. Imperfection doesn't mean that you cannot set standards that you wouldn't fulfill. In fact, some standards can be met. Some desires can be fulfilled. But how long? So imperfection means you cannot finish. You cannot just close the loop. You cannot just say this is done and then it will be isolated and stays as it is because it will keep changing it will be subject to impermanence and interdependence so the perfection as an idea cannot be kept look at relationships what it means to have a correct human relationship it means nothing but have a lot of faith in the other and put a lot of energy into the relationship with your presence with your love and compassion and all kinds of positive emotions that keep that relationship alive. Because it's never perfect in a sense that it's finished or it's done. You know, even after 20 years, 25 years, you have to put energy into it. So if you see these three things and now we become super practical, then you see our situation on Earth. And Let's keep our wonderful circle. And if you look at this Earth, Earth is superbly finite, very, very finite. It is not growing in size, it is not growing in resources. Human beings, however, we are increasing in number exponentially. That increase meant that 200 years ago, this is years, this is number of people. 200 years ago, 1 billion. About 100 years ago, 2 billion. 50 years ago, 
3 billion 20 years ago already four and a half billion and 10 years ago five and a half billion now seven this is seven billion people on this planet we're growing the planet stays the same the slice that we can take is less and less and less individually however our desires are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger 200 years ago if you were a nobleman you had a castle you had a bunch of horses you had a bunch of horse carts a bunch of soldiers etc and the commoner had maybe a house maybe a couple of horses and other cattle and uh, many of them didn't even have that then they had so the individual situation 200 years ago with 1 billion people and the current situation when everybody wants a car and a house and a weekend house and uh, international travels and whatnot is growing. So more people with more desire on a finite planet which is dwindling in resources. That's what we've got. And funnily enough, all the systems that are now kind of supporting our lives, all the infrastructure the net, the education system, the healthcare system, the kind of more or less stable political system. These systems actually are meant not just to sustain life on earth because it's meant not to sustain it, but to grow it. To grow it even beyond this number. Now what can you do? When you see this, you can say that something's very wrong here. The very things that we hold dear, stability, accountability, sustainability is working against a sustainable life on this planet. So what can we do? Now we have a huge dilemma of quality versus quantity. Korea has 50 million people at present. Hungary has 10 million with about 10% less of the land area. The social kind of stability in Hungary is way lower than in Korea with five times more inhabitants. I used to say, if you put five Hungaries into Korea, you would have a civil war. Korea doesn't have that. Korea has relative stability. Why? Because of the quantity of the social situation, the number of people, with the quality of society, the ethos and morality that people used to live together. So if you have a very high amount of people, you have to have a very clear structure and a very clear function in this structure, how people are supposed to relate to each other. In Korea, this used to be Confucianism, pairing up with Taoism and Buddhism and lately with a bunch of monotheistic incoming religions. And you can see the effect. If this kind of social ethos, social morality, is inclusive and group-based, then people's egos are kept at a check. You downscale yourself a little bit so as to give space to the other, so as to cooperate with the other, to be resourceful and use as little resources as possible. When you have another ethos, whether it's religious, social, economic, financial, whatever ethos and morality you have, if it supports uh, dualistic views, individual desires, uh, competition with uh, the kind of limited view that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, then the quality of society goes down because we give less space to each other. We are less ready to share. We lose the notion of a common substance, a human substance that we all share that actually makes us human beings. So quantity has to be really balanced out with quality. So when we have a rising population, then we can only hope and make some effort consciously that we increase our quality as human beings. Individually, you can do this by clearing your own mind and be as real and clear as possible. See clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch and think clearly. That's the basis of your clear mind as a human being. With the relationship to others, the quality increase comes with less desire, less anger, less ignorance. 
and when that quality increases, then the, quality, then the quantity increase is not a problem. But when there is no quality, then sooner or later there's war, there's social unrest, there's fight over resources, and then we kill each other instead of supporting each other. So, it begins with your mind. Then it goes into relationships. Then it goes into the group ethos or the group mind that generates the group karma of that particular nation or group or civilization. So what we can say that when you have holy wars, then everything goes into the dark ages. We had that in Europe for hundreds of years and look at the result. It took us a thousand years to come out of the decline of the Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire fell in 476 AD and Galileo got almost burnt at the stakes at 1600. So you can talk about Renaissance and pre-Renaissance, 15th century, 14th. There's no real change in the minds until one gets burnt for somebody's faith or religion. Okay? And that was in 1600. It was over a thousand years. And then very quickly something came. Science and then industrial era, and then quote-unquote modern post-industrial society that has lost most of the wisdom that we used to have in the East. Our 2,000-year-old spiritual or religious tradition in the West was the hotbed for a very egotistical behavior that manufactured two world wars within 50 years. The first and the second. And after the second, you can have these many local painful spots like Vietnam, Korea for that matter. And these days a lot of spots in Africa and South America. So, what can we possibly do? First, like the old Romans used to say in Latin, ate in cipi, which means begin with yourself. So, begin with yourself. Begin to clean up your own mess inside and do your own homework inside so that your energy, while you are young, could turn inwards and you would gain some insight who you truly are. If you know yourself well, it's the biggest capital you can have. Your own errors are the only ones that actually lead you to ruin. There's nobody else doing harm to you, only yourself. It begins with your own ignorance that somebody can lie to you. It begins with your own desire that somebody can manipulate you. And it begins with your own anger that somebody can make you violent. If you take these out, or lower them as much as possible, your mind will be clear. You understand inside, through your direct experience, what kind of personality you are. What kind of karma you have. And moment to moment you have the choice to act certain things out and not act certain things out by speech, thought, emotions, and actions. This kind of clarity we call mind space, your own mind space. If it's cluttered up by unnecessary information, that means your mind is unclear because you cannot detach from your own mind content, you cannot stay like a mirror and you can only be part of this huge flow of binary information. If you saw The Matrix, you know what I mean. The movie was produced 15 years ago and there was no such big change or paradigmatic change ever since in that industry. So that was an artwork that can wake people up. And your own personal awakening, to whatever extent you pursue that, can be the guarantee that your time on this earth will be not only effective, for yourself, but also useful for others. Because ultimately, this kind of division, which I symbolized with the circle between you and the world, is just at the level of form. We have all different bodies. You sit there, you all sit there, I stand here. It's a very clear distinction and it's better be that way. Our minds are also different. Some Polish, some Austrian, American? <laughs> no? Where from? Norway. From Norway. Tak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
or Korean, many kinds of uh, locations, and maybe also Singapore. Singapore. Was I? <laughs> so these are the minds. Very different karma. Some people like noodles. Chop sway a little bit. Some like yogurt. Or maybe a little bit of knedli. <laughs> but what is important that our minds, beyond the individual differences, have the same substance. We call that human nature. And that human nature is possible to experience. It may seem that we are going very far from the world's current problems at the form level. But remember, if we don't fix things at the mental level, we cannot fix things in the form level as well, or either. So, when we talk about governments, resources, exploitation, wars, it's like trying to fix things like trimming the leaves of a huge tree that keeps growing. How about going to the root of the problem? The root of the problem is called I, my, me. The root of the problem is that we don't understand ourselves. We don't understand each other. We don't see what links us together. We don't see what can increase the quality of our minds and therefore our relationships and our function on this planet. So when we see the circle as a progress, we can outline five points. 0, 90, 180, 270, and 360. At zero degrees, you have no questions. Everybody else is at fault. The world is to blame. I'm fine. I'm okay. And please fix this thing for me. I have nothing to do with it. I'm here by mistake, actually. I was just dropped here from a spaceship. And as funny as it may sound, some people do have this attitude that I'm just here by mistake. This is not really me. And I just want to get by in my small little world. Okay? And everything else is not my problem. Leave me alone. That's zero. No questions, therefore no solutions. And as small as it may seem, this view is small, but the problem that it represents is very big. Okay? But nobody can stay like that. In your teenage time, you already got into your first emotional crisis. And there's a, oh, what does it mean to be a man or a woman or having this body? What does this really mean? What am I supposed to do with it? Things like that. So when that happens, then you have your first questions and then you start to study. So the first section is actually studying what you're doing here. But as clever as you may, uh, you may be, and I, you cannot go higher than 90 degrees. It's like having a map which is so super detailed that it almost equals the terrain. You know so much and so precisely about the world that you have almost all the knowledge that you can possibly get. However, the map will never be the terrain. Your knowledge will never be substituted for the reality. Remember that. Okay? Our analytic intellect wants to fish in the water or the sea of reality and catch everything. Now, even if we are as meticulous with our analytic intellect as fishermen in the seas these days and they are overfishing heavily, we cannot get the sea out with the fishing net. You can only get the fish. So your analytic intellect can only get to logical conclusions, but not fish the sea out. You can only get the fish itself, but not the sea. And to be able to merge with the sea, to truly attain and experience what the sea is, a totally reverse type of action is necessary. Put down the fishing net, steers to some waters that are kind of shark-free, and jump into the sea yourself. That's experience. So when you realize that no matter how much you know, you cannot know enough, and you cannot substitute that for reality, you begin practicing some kind of practice, work, experience, whatever you call it. And then you get in direct touch with something. Now, at the meditation level, 180 is actually the experience of your true nature, your true human substance that we have spoken about. But in your everyday life, 
here is where you, where you get some real result. So at this point, you can talk about substance like human, human substance, or in everyday life you get some definitive and very cl clear result or experience itself. Okay. Now, this, this kind of result or experience can mean a lot. This can mean that you can actually start to make a difference. At the meditation level, when you do some kind of mind practice, you start to change your karma. When you work and you become a research fellow or a professor, whatever profession you choose, then you can start changing your field of study. I mean, that's what Einstein did when he actually realized what is relativity, okay? So, this kind of experience actually gets the tool in your hand. The first result is you become spiritually independent, or in your workplace you become somebody to count with. And when that happens, then you start to make a difference. And in this sense we call it transformation. Transformation. You start to make a difference. You transform the field. You transform yourself. And when that happens, at 270, you get what we call freedom. It's a very different freedom from this liberté, because that liberté in, from 1789 until Napoleon fell in 1813, in a meager 25 years, that liberty killed more people than any other idea. And later on, we could get other social and political ideologies in Europe that were killing hundreds of millions of people, look at communism or extreme other views. And the first was this idea of liberty. Liberty itself is very necessary in its truest sense. We need that. But the idea of freedom has killed more than any before. So that's why ideas will never work. Ideas, uh, ignorant views will lead us to ruin. And correct cognition of reality can lead us to a much better quality of life on this planet. <clears throat> so then, 2.7 is freedom. And then comes the application of that freedom. In other words, your views, your actions, your life begins really to help other people. And that application means it's going way beyond your own personal boundaries, or maybe your cultural boundaries, Anything that you thought of as a hindrance is gone. And here, zero degrees was the absolute tight ego without any solutions. And in that sense, 360 becomes the solution. And of course, I will not tell you what that is. You have to discover it for yourselves in your everyday life. You have to know what you want. You have to pursue, and whether you like it or not, you will go through these phases, okay? And that clarity which I'm talking about, and that clarity which we can all attain, can help us share our dwindling resources, change our view completely. Otherwise, we will be kept in ignorance by the few who can use this infrastructure to spread so much zeros, so many zeros and ones, that you lose the essence, okay? So, the tragedy of the commoners begins with your ignorance, your attachments, your wrong views. Now, clear away your attachments, get rid of your wrong views, set up a clear priority, what is most important and who is most important, what is and who is less and then unimportant. And this kind of structure of very much and not so much gives you energy because these are polarities. These polarities have energy differences. This can give you motivation to know what is very, 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 very important and who is very important. And then less and less and less. If you don't have this structure, then you will get stuck on an LCD screen for the rest of your life and just have this indifferentiated stream of data coming and going before you. Now watch out for that. Do you have your own internal set of priorities? Do you have your own value system? Do you know what is important for you, for us, for humanity in this life? If you don't know that, start looking. 
start looking because you are already in that age when you should basically have an outline of your life. And if you don't, then someone else will. Then someone else will tell you very cleverly what you should do with your life. Don't let that happen to yourself. So work together with people you trust. Do things that you have reason to believe in and have the courage to follow these two, no matter what kind of opinion others may have. Opinions are negligible. True feedback based on reality is something that we need to heed, we need to take care of and preciously pay attention to. How do you separate fiction from, reali from reality, opinion from true feedback, self-knowledge from uh, the illusion of the ego? Only you can make that difference with your clarity, which no one can give you. You can attain that, you can experience that, because the potential is within you. Nowhere else, okay? So I think this is plenty for introduction, maybe even too much. But I hope this was challenging and provocative enough that you would ask your questions. So uh, how can... Zero and 360 be the same state, but then it's so different. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what okay. you mean. Because the zero is the beginning, and in that sense, in that sense, 360 is the end. So this is before you start your great journey, and 360 is when you're complete. So zero is nothing, and 360 is everything. The Alpha and the Omega are really coming from the same place. That's why they are in the same location. But one is zero and the other is 360. Big difference, like everything and nothing. Okay, but how can everything be nothing? No. And nothing be everything? We don't say that it's the same. It would be a mistake. Some people actually want that. Well, can't we just make a shortcut by writing three and six before the zero and we're all done. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So you start with the same kind of mind and end with the same kind of mind, but zero is actually total ignorance and 360 is enlightenment, but the mind is the same. So the mind manufactures ignorance or the mind stays enlightened. That's why your question is very good because you noticed what we methodically put into this circle as a metaphor or teaching device. That you begin with yourself, but you also end with your own non-self, okay? Good. More questions? Uh, my question is uh, regarding science and technology. Okay. Yeah, just I understand the science and technology totally changed our lives in these days. But just the, the just I'm fear, I feel from your, uh, your speech, science and technology cannot uh, mm, cannot change or cannot uh, affect uh, and, uh, our mind. I didn't say that. Oh, I'm you didn't saying, say that. I didn't say it doesn't affect you. Mm -hmm. I didn't say it's uh, kind of secondary. What I said and keep saying that you use technology. And if you do that consciously, you can use technology for something very, very good. But if you don't use technology consciously, then this technology uses you and those people who actually control it. So that's why we should be super careful how much audiovisual we take, how much we stay on the net, how dependent we are on our smartphones, etc, etc, etc. So be very clear. What we created as a scientific post-industrial uh, cyber warfare society is neither good nor bad. But if we don't have a clear relationship with it, then we cannot give a correct function to it. So first we see the situation. Our situation is that we live in this world. We are looking at glass and steel and concrete most of our lives, unless you go out to the forest. Okay? Then your relationship with it is that this thing is operated by technology and people behind or beyond that technology. Now, if you see that relationship, you see your own hand in it, okay? And once that relationship is clear, your function can also be clear. But if you don't see your own hand in this technological world, 
then this technology will use you and you just become a robot. A sentient robot. Now that's not such a good outlook. All right? Um, there's a transformation phase. Yeah, I think yeah the it, transformation phase. Yeah. Uh, for me, it seems really uh, the most difficult part. Oh, yeah. Because um, sometimes a lot of people um, have this kind of knowledge, the study phase, uh -huh. and then the uh, practice phase or the experience phase. So yeah. uh, many people would think one thing but act in a different way because of the circumstances but not in a really bad manner but because uh, uh, we're supposed to or, or, or actually they might think that something is wrong but act in the positive way so there are many contradictions between the uh, study and practice phase and if you want to get to the freedom part the 270 yes. yeah can you get there with those contradictions or you have to eliminate them before. Very good question. Bardzo dobrze. Why? Because at 180, the contradictions are gone. That's a state of mind when there are no concepts. If there are no concepts, there cannot be any contradictions. That's the meditative part. In your life, when you get a real, actual experience or proof or result, then there is no contradiction at all. Okay? So, 180 is the peak where there are no doubts, because there are no dualities, and that's it. Before that, of course, there are fluctuations within, did I study right? Does practice confirm it? Then there is this kind of working out process, okay? But, at 180, that's it, conclusive. And then, you can use that kind of result to transform your life, your field, and eventually attain that kind of freedom. Einstein is a great example. I mean, you know, he was a clerk in a patent office in Switzerland. And then he had these questions lingering in his mind. And one day, kaboom! It was like an awakening experience. And what he realized, since I'm not a theoretical physicist, I would just term as relativity. That's it. But in Buddhism, we also have a very clear notion of relativity to all phenomena. And that relativity I spelled out at the beginning with the three I's. Do you remember that? What was the first? Impermanence. Wonderful. What was the second? Interdependence. Excellent. Ladies, be louder. What was the third? Imperfection. Great. So that's relativity as we put it. You know? So when Einstein had his relativity, when Buddha had his enlightenment, experience, they all got to a very conclusive and very clear proof in their field. And that's 180. So get there. Don't stop before you get there. Okay? That this is the result, this is the evidence, this is the purpose that you have been striving for, and you got that. Okay? That's your effort. That's your way. And then you can start making a difference. Then you can transform with that novelty, with that clarity. And then you can actually get to some greater freedom than before. All right? And just as to add to your question, at zero, the self is airtight. The ego is totally undivided, unbroken, un unmitigated. And at 360, no ego. Okay? More questions? Um, as for the freedom, Phase. Yeah, everybody loves that, the freedom. How? Freedom! <laughs> so you go through your study and you go through your experience. Pra practice slash work slash experience, yeah. Um, surely it will be very difficult um, to realize whatever you think is your freedom. Maybe it really isn't. Maybe it is. If you did this thing right, then 270 is actual. If not, then it becomes virtual. Right. Try and test. Can anyone anything disturb it? You know, Einstein's equations, they have been broken down to the last atom, the last decimal, and reassembled and rewritten and recalculated. Friedman was a great guy to do that. So if you're interested how the 180 of Einstein was checked, then read this guy, Friedman. Friedman double-checked him. So if your results are really conclusive, then they will stand the test of time. 
the Buddha's tradition, what our mind is, what's the relationship between mind and body, that result kept evolving, 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 but the original result was never refuted. Never. So this is really important. What you contribute to humanity with can evolve, can be part of something different later. But by itself, the way you reached it and presented it will not be refuted. Okay, that's freedom. Uh, I hasten to add freedom at the everyday level, which I am trying all my best to bring this teaching down to. That would make sense for you, okay? But in actual meditation or mental state, that means you can transform any kind of karma into anything. Your enemy can become your best friend. The impossible becomes possible. Life and death cease to be a problem. Having a body or not having a body ceases to be a problem. So that's how far you can get. But with freedom, in the everyday sense, it also means that anybody can say anything about your work, your result, your conclusive evidence, and it doesn't affect you. Because this thing stands the test of time, and again experiments, and again challenges, and proofs, and whatnot. Okay? What are those things on non-science things where you can measure them um, against the uh, objective? Define science for me. Or, um, let's say uh, I am an artist. Yeah. And um, perhaps my, the, the art that I produce uh -huh. cannot stand the test of anything except my own. Uh -huh. So where would my freedom come in? In your gallery. <laughs> in your wonderful misulkwan. That's it. So, again, I presume you don't make your art for yourself. Just for yourself. There has to be at least one person, some kind of audience, who, who is important for you, right? Now, if there's just one person who says, Ah! Chateta! When there's something like that, you have what we call job satisfaction number two. Job satisfaction number one is that you intrinsically, in your guts, you feel that you did the right thing. You feel that what you produced is actually an artwork and not some crapple. Okay? So that kind of uh, self-reassurance -re sh should pair up with at least one person or a group of people saying that, you did well. And if you believe in it and others also believe in it, then the artwork can have a, kind of a life of its own. But art is really, really tricky in that sense that it's non-scientific, fortunately, otherwise it could be computerized and artificial intelligence would eventually produce better art than humans. But we are not there, fortunately, and we will never be. So human art will always remain human. Like our human situation will always remain human, no matter what kind of machinery or intelligent layer of life we produce on top of it or at the bottom, okay? So, what is art? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. You can read books this thick about it. But when you truly go to uh, like La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, have you ever been there? Has anybody been to this huge church is magnificent Gaudi artwork of a cathedral, then even if you don't know anything about art, you attain. What is true architectural art in a religious setting? But that's so open that you can have any kind of symbolism or religion in it, the effect would be the same. That's what I got when I got there like two and a half months ago. And that was awesome. So you feel it. If you don't feel the magnificence of that art, there can be explanations this, this thick and so long, it will not be there. Uh, which field are you at? Politics. Politics. Yeah. That's an artwork. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? <clears throat> yeah. So, in Buddhism, it's always this, um, when I read books or hear people talk, and um, it's always a focus on kind of to free yourself from your desires or from your, uh, you know, the outer world or, you know, the, yeah. I don't know how to explain it, but... Uh, Go ahead, we'll I, read it out. Go ahead. I feel like 
are there some things that are good, like, for example, love? I might have some kind of connection with a person that is very important, but I'm dependent on that person, uh -huh. and that person is dependent on me, but can't that be like a good thing? Why does it have to be a bad thing? Well, uh, can I kindly update your view on Buddhism? <laughs> I would, I would like you not to worry about love. Never. Um, Buddhism teaches that if you have greed and anger, these are the two sides of the same coin. One is productive, the desire for something. The other is destructive, the desire for the non-existence of something. If you have greed and anger, then you have a problem. If you uh, have a loving and mutually consented wonderful relationship, then uh, who would say that there's any anything wrong with it as long as you can keep it clear? What do I mean by that? Like we said the three eyes, nothing and no one stays the same. If you look at married life, married life in the first month, the first year, the 10th year and the 25th year, they look very different. Can people preserve the seeds of their love, goodwill, compassion to each other through these many years? Can they keep love as it is? Or they go through the forceful and necessary transformation of love becomes possession, then jealousy, then territoriality, attrition, and then a personal war. You can see the relationships decrease and deteriorate into this way too often. There's nothing wrong with love, it's great. In fact, no human being is ever complete without experiencing that. Very, very important. But how do you preserve true love by not deteriorating into these secondary, tertiary products of a wonderful emotional exchange and relationship? How do you not become jealous and possessive and territorial? So that is the question, and for that, love itself should be truly experienced for what it is. And be always coming back to the beginning mind, like the first day when you fall in love, even after 20 years. How can we do that? I've spoken about the moment as the key. And if that moment is clear, then you always have the spark for the other and likewise, you know, vice versa. So beginning and beginner's mind and true love, they are going hand in hand. And if you can have that, then these kind of secondary products, they will not appear. Or if they appear, you can always go beyond them and recycle the energy. Because this is also a huge recycling system if you notice it. Recycle the energy to the beginning again. So that's really important and uh, a relationship is a huge training and if you take it like that then you will not want this kind of tight and possessive outcome that out of this loving relationship which actually dissolves yourself. That's one of the important experiences. When you have this true loving relationship, your self is gone. And there's only us, not I plus I. And that oneness is the first experience of your ego dissolving totally. And it's mutual. And if both people become equally loving, equally vulnerable, equally dependent on each other, then we experience something in this human life which we cannot otherwise. It's wonderful. But how do you keep it clear? How do you keep it selfless? How do you keep it in such a way that love remains love and doesn't become this junk? Now, that is the practice in it. And that is the practice that we have at various levels with each other. Does this answer your question? Mm. Then into the mic. Yes. Uh, and no. <laughs> So I've read some books that talk a lot about attachment and how mm -hmm. it's not good to be attached to something. You should try to be not attached to it, like just become part of the whole but without being attached. 
I don't know if you understand what I mean. I do. Yes, but when you continue. Are, <laughs> when you're in love, I feel like you are attached to someone, and I feel like that's really important. It's like a bond between you. Why mm -hmm. should you have to break that bond? No, no, never. But how can you become non-attached if you have like this kind of bond with someone? Or okay. you know, yeah. Got my question. I got your question. Now comes the biggest question. How can we have love and freedom at the same time? Because attachment yeah. is the opposite of freedom. Okay. And everybody has a very important kind of tool to realize what uh, attachment and detachment means. And that tool is not just your soul. Your soul is very complex, but something as simple as your hand. Now, if I'm attached to this blue pen, because I love it so much. So much. When I have to write something in red, I cannot do that. One mind, one hand, okay? So, my attachment prevents me from taking the red pen. So, the books were right. If you release your attachment, and you let go of your mind object, sometimes a lost relationship or something that totally went beyond repair. You have to attain freedom. Just happened recently. Okay. So then you attain freedom and then you have your own next wonderful pen in your which is red. It's hot and it's just, hmm, just fire. So then it becomes different. Nonetheless, what is important that the movement of letting go and the movement of attaching was your choice. And in, a case of, in the case of a relationship, your mutual choice. Now, if you are attached to the past, you cannot live the present. So that's why those books said, don't attach to anything. But if you don't attach to anything, and you do not consciously establish a bondage or a relationship, that means you become attached to freedom. And that... It's symbolized with this. I love my empty hand. I love my empty hand so much that I refuse to grab or hold anything. So even though I want the red pen, I cannot do that. Because I refuse to clinch. I refuse to bond. And when that happens, there is this huge suffering that people are free, but they are lonely and isolated. Okay? So attachment to freedom results in the same incapabilities as being attached to something with one difference you have an object in your hand and you're attached to that and that renders you incapable or limited then you're attached to your freedom you have nothing and that attachment to nothingness and no oneness renders you incapable lonely and isolated and miserable now Let's keep the operational word of bondage for a differentiation. If this bondage between human beings is based on free will, commitment, it's, it's wonderful. And then it can become what we term as loyalty. So love is like the first phase on a huge rocket. Like beauty is the first layer of so on somebody's personality. And behind and beyond that beauty, you can soon discover what else that person has. Okay? So beauty is just the packaging. Once it comes off, the relationship is established. Of course, beauty is still there, but then you discover what other layers, what other personality traits the other person has, and that's when your training begins, and so does the other. In that sense, bondage is necessary. Commitment is necessary. Without loyalty, we are just dust in the air. Okay? Now, that has no attachment, just commitment and correct bondage, freely chosen. But when does bondage become attachment? When somebody wants to get free, but the other doesn't let him or her do that. Then this kind of attachment can become a total and absolute relationship terror. And people are too afraid, too manipulated, and they don't dare to move, and the other is limited enough not to want to let them go. Okay? Losing the primary perspective that really love is mutual. True love is based on free consent. And when that doesn't happen, then bondage becomes attachment, and attachment becomes suffering. 
Are we clear about this? Yes. Uh, it should be because there's nothing and no one that can explain this to you at the verbal level. Uh, we can, teachers can give you guidance, but ultimately your own heart and the other person involved will teach you what this is. But guidance is important. The, this kind of cognitive distinction, bondage, attachment, freedom, uh, incapability, or being limited, these are good for the intellect. But once you translate that to articulate your own emotions, then that will help. Because you see moment to moment, what kind of relationship do I have with the other? What do I really mean by my heart, not necessarily by my thinking? And that's the value of learning some relationship training. Okay? Other questions? You talked about art in the CP, the good of the um, Right? The Latin saying. I talked about what? Art in CP. Art, art in CP. Speak yeah. Latin. Art in CP. Yes, good. Yeah, begin with yourself, right? <laughs> yes, begin with yourself. Uh, doesn't that convey a very egocentric way of thinking? Think about first and then you look through your ego, it's egotistical. But in Christianity, we learn that you love your neighbor and um, doesn't it sort of contradict each other? No. Because if you love your neighbor, you begin with yourself loving your neighbor. You don't wait for your neighbor to love you. Begin with yourself is not a narcissistic, screwed up statement. It, it activates you. It really gives you the initiative because it comes straight from your heart. You don't have to wait for something or someone so that this thing would happen. Did this help? So begin with yourself. No one can eat your food for you. Only you can. Okay? More questions? I just I want to uh, go back to science and technology. I asked you before. <laughs> I'm wondering. Uh, sorry, I'm I major. I major in the uh, the environmental education. So wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, I'm. Uh, I have questions. How we can balance between uh, uh, some science and uh, science and emotion. For example, I uh, I teach the uh, some scientific law to the students mm -hmm. but at the time I'm wondering if they they can lose some uh, sense of uh, wonder about nature uh, with only the uh, with knowledge of, with uh, knowledge of science only so um, can you catch up <laughs> yes my, my ideas Human science and eco-friendly science is very important. You know how science was actually developed? Do you know that? The origins of science? Okay. I talked about Galilei. He had a friend. He didn't know him, but he actually heard about him. Giordano Bruno. He lived 100 years before Galilei. And for exactly the same kind of views that he understood nature by his own experience, he got burnt at the stake by the Catholic Church. And the reason was because what the church was teaching and what Giordano Bruno was teaching, they were different. But one was really based on experience and the other was based on dogma. And dogma and experience, they were fighting. And at that time, it seemed that the stronger one was winning, which was the church. But ultimately, no one can take away your own eyes, your own ears, your own nose, tongue, body and mind. And your mind, once you start thinking clearly, is on the right track for truth. That track was science. So how do you understand this world, nature, human beings, without religious interference and interception? That's how science was developed. I always ask myself, how come that science was developed in Europe? Why? Why not in the Orient? Why not in North America, or in South America, or Australia, or Africa? Why? And the reason is that in Europe, the mental conditions were such that the church and the dogma were denying your own experience, so people rebelled. That rebellious attitude that 
I believe my eyes, I believe my ears, I believe my own sensations, I believe my rational thinking, that resulted in science. And just as to reiterate the three basic principles of science is that A, it has to be essential experience. So the first is you have to be able to experience it, then experiment, then rational explanation, and actually these two belong to the first, that's the second, and the third is repeat. So if you can experimentally prove it, if you can rationally explain it, if you can repeat these two, that's science. If not, it's not science. But as we went on, science forgot about the self, the human being. We treated everything as matter, because matter was experimentally provable. You could prove things only in material realm. And only about 30-40 years ago, when this kind of energy turned towards the psyche, that's when psychology developed, and the scientific study of the human psyche began. Freud and Jung and Adler and then just opened up like a lotus flower, okay? So that's when the scientific study of the human mind began to make inroads into Oriental philosophy, and that included Buddhism as well, a bunch of others too. If you look at Carl Gustav Jung and his relationship with Tibetan Buddhism, or R Rudolf Steiner and Hinduism, and all these things, Steiner was not a psychologist, I just make it very clear, uh, then you see how science took this huge loop that leave me alone with anything religious. I'm not interested in that because it limits me 400 years ago. I mean, Galilei had to retract his own teaching so as to save himself and his friends. And on his deathbed he said, yet it moves. Another Latin, eppur si move, okay? Yet it moves. So that's when things really started as science. And then came Newton and then Kepler and Copernicus and all, all these folks that really altered our view on this planet. But we were seriously missing something. Science came at the expense of spirituality slash religion because religious views were so invasive and so repressive four or five hundred years ago that they they just totally put people in and that's the dark ages okay but now science goes overboard science treats everything as matter even our own psyche as some kind of matter invisible matter and that's when we should say stop and look stop and look inside you find something which is neither thinking nor matter, yet it exists. That's what we call our substance, our true human substance. No name, no thinking, no cognition, no form, no matter, no material Sorry. sensory existence. Okay? So, if you see science in this larger context, how it developed and how it transformed, then uh, you will not feel that it would be alien to humans or removed from reality or somehow have a duality between nature and man. Keep a wide mind about it, see how it began to be an independent science and how it just had to be totally connected to the human psyche and nature as well. And then this feeling of duality or isolation will stop. Okay? More questions? So, uh, I think most of us or every one of us perform different social roles these days. Uh, we are students, uh, uh, son, daughter, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend. And while doing that, if, if uh, you want to get to the third phase, the 180, the meditation. Yes, that one. So Actually, meditation doesn't start here. Oh, okay, so between the practice and... The Meditation would start here on your kind of spiritual oh, path. This okay. is study, this is practice, meditation, it starts ah. here and this is the result, the attainment. Okay, so that phase between nine, uh, 90 and 180? That's practice slash work yeah. slash experimenting. Yeah, that's right. So the experimenting would uh, maybe require us to um, 
underperform yes. in some of social forms. Yes. Being less of a son, being not a good student, maybe not underperform in my workplace. Mm -hmm. And we, we live in a very fast-paced world and we sometimes we don't even have time to stop and... You don't have time? What do you have <laughs> instead? <laughs> Come on, don't delude yourself. I mean, Ask a that, I mean that would uh, require us to change our priorities. That's yes, what I mean. Not that's the point. In that kind of sense, we yeah. don't have time. So we have to uh, rearrange rec our um, settings that yeah. we work on. And um, is there any um, easy way to do that? Or it easy? require us have you to... When you were born, have you seen this sign? Uh -huh. Easy, and then you just stepped S out. No, it didn't work like that. So... Um, so what I'm saying, like we we are uh, we have these habits. We work uh -huh. by these uh, preference every day. We copy, yeah. do the same kind of routines. Yeah. And in order to let's say advance in the uh, cycle, yeah. we would have to change them. When sometimes we feel like actually okay. it would be really hard, or maybe it would be impossible to do yeah. so. So is there any um, how do you, how can we uh, overcome this? Uh, uh, basically. Basically, what you should do is ask yourself, what is most important? If you do that, then everything is fine. If you don't ask the question, and again, somebody else will take your time, something else will set your priorities, it's up to you. Time originally doesn't exist. It exists for us because we are born into this body. When you don't have this body, there is no linear time. But as long as we have this body, we have it. Deal with it. So... Then you have to set your priorities. What comes first in your timeline? And uh, if you ask the question, what am I supposed to do right now? Who am I supposed to call right now? Then these priorities will soon become clear. Allow yourself some introspection, some meditation, and let the dust settle so that you could see clearly. And then your priorities will become abundantly clear. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your precious attention today. And uh, I certainly hope to see you sometime later in life, uh, whether you are interested in meditation or not. Being interested in Zen is not a priority or a parameter. Uh, please keep your path very straight, look ahead, and um, try to be as genuine to yourself, as original as possible. And then you can be true, who you truly are and help this world, help yourself, help all beings. Thank you very much.